Hi everyone, my name is Eric Holmquist. I'm the Quality Control Lab second shift trainer at Perigo. Uh, I'm going to pass the microphone on to Nick Connor. Hi, my name is Nicholas Connor. I am a graduate, as Dr. Nolan said, from, the, from this, this class. I work in the raw materials department for the Quality Control Lab. Um, and I've been there for five years and I do very little testing now, but um, we, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And, but uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Andrew Fine. I work in the QC lab also in the liquid value stream department. And I've been there uh, about a year and a half. And uh, it's a very good company. All right, so the objectives of this PowerPoint basically, we're, we want to go over a brief history of what Perigo is. So are you guys familiar with what Perigo is at this point? Some of you might be. Most people don't know, so we'll go into detail, you know, what it is. Uh, we're going to talk about what our job is basically. So. Uh, what you guys might expect if you continue through the program, what we applied from this program at our job. Uh, we'll talk about the equipment that we use. So some of you may have had experience with the equipment. Uh, and then we'll talk about how we use it and how you guys applied it here. Uh, and then we're going to go over employment opportunities. So if you are interested someday coming to Perigo, we'll go over like the benefits and all of that good information. Uh, we'll have questions at the end. But if you have questions during the presentation, uh, just go ahead and shout out. Uh, where is your hand? It doesn't matter. Or hold off till the end. So Perigo then. So back in the day, we were started by Luther Perigo in 1887. So occasionally on a bottle you might see El Perigo instead of just Perigo. So that's where the L comes from, is Luther. Uh, we started as a general store in apple drying business. Uh, we were packaging and distributing uh, patented medicines and other uh, products to country stores. Uh, we designed the private label concept. Uh, so essentially what that was, it was about the 1920s. We offered to put the company's name on the bottle that they were buying from us. Uh, today that's known as like the store brand. So you see all of our products here, you don't see Perigo anywhere in big letters on that. You're going to see, you know, CVS or Walgreens. So that's what's on the label. Perigo today, we are the world's largest manufacturer of over-the-counter pharmaceutical and nutritional products for store brand. Uh, we manufacture and dis distribute over 1,200 products each year. Some more interesting stats. Uh, last year, we uh, manufactured over 45 billion, 44 billion tablets. Uh, and that's broken down a little bit further. 39 billion of those tablets are actually made in North America. So we are global, so I'll go over that in a few more slides. Uh, we are the largest producer of aspirin in the United States, second largest producer of ibuprofen and acetaminophen. So uh, some people know that as Tylenol or Advil. You guys probably have taken that before. Uh, any of these products look familiar to anyone? Good. And a famous quote from our CEO, Joe Papa. Uh, he says it's just about every presentation he has. Every second of every day, consumers take about 1,000 Perigo products. Uh, just gives you an idea of how big we actually are. Some more interesting facts. This year was our best year to date, $2.7 billion in revenue. Uh, customer base includes the following. Uh, another interesting stat, uh, they estimate that we save consumers about $5 billion a year from sw switching the name brand stuff to the uh, generic store brand. Uh, so that, again, gives you another fun fact on how big we are and how much money we save consumers. Uh, we are global now, a little over 7,000 employees. That gives you some of the key locations and where we're located. Uh, we're always acquiring new companies. So recently we've acquired a company in Australia, Israel, uh, I think Vermont was another uh, place we just acquired a new company. So uh, we are growing. That being said, we're actually uh, housed in Allegan. So that's where our headquarters are, a little over 2,700 employees. Uh, it's the primary location of production for over-the-counter products. Uh, so like Tylenol, ibuprofen, uh, most of these products here in the, on the front counter, those are actually made in Allegan. So. And uh, our job here at Perigo, uh, spe specifically for the quality control lab, uh, we ensure products meet FDA requirements for potency and safety, um, testing raw materials and process mixes, liquids, and final packaged products. Um, right now, in our quality control lab, we have, we're separated into three groups. Raw materials testing, which is what I 
um, which is what I do. I do a lot of the raw materials testing. Uh, that includes, um, actually, you know, we'll get into that in a little bit here. We do tablet product testing, which is what um, Eric has done a lot of, and then liquid product testing, which is what Andy is um, doing. Okay, so the raw materials testing. Uh, this group tests individual ingre ingredients used to make our products, and we uh, what those products are, are we have active, uh, pharmaceutical ingredients, which is our aspirin, ibuprofen, loratadine, and we have excipients, uh, which is our sugars, starches, waxes, and flavors. So the actives are just what the primary thing is in that pill, and then your excipients are what is used in the synthesis of that product. So uh, I can show you guys just a little, here's a pill box right here, and on the label you can see what the active ingredients are, and then if you flip it over, those there's a... Um, a little section there that tells you what all the excipients are or the inactive <coughs> ingredients. Okay, raw material tests. Raw material testing is done to ensure we receive the correct material that 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 it meets our and excuse me, and it, that it meets our quality of standards. So we have that se segregated out to identification tests, uh, physical characteristics, and purity. So we do a lot of the identification stuff right up front. Right, that's the very first thing you do in raw materials testing is you do identification, because if it doesn't pass the ID test, then there, there's really no reason for us to test it any further, because if it there's there's been instances where they just mislabel the product and we'll get the incorrect material, and we we'll just reject that batch right up front. So, and that would be your NIR, FTIR, which we'll get into in a little bit. Uh, some of the chemicals uh, testing that we do is a lot of reaction testing, um, you know, colors, color changes, titrations, um, things, things like that. And then for physical characteristics, we do particle size, like screen tests. We'll have a couple different mesh screens. You'll pour your products on top of that. And we have this uh, instrument that will, that we, you, you set it at a calibrated time and it shakes it for that amount of time and then you just weigh out your screens. And uh, we have, um, specifications that those have to match and if all the specifications on that pass then we can proceed to the purity and which is basically just you know the potency of our compounds that we get in. Um, other testing by raw materials group. The raw materials group also tests products Perigo purchases from other companies. Uh, the reason why we purchase products from different companies is because we just don't have certain resources that other companies have so it's way more cost efficient for us to just buy it from them rather than us buying the equipment, validating the equipment, which could take months, years. Um, and examples of those products that we buy are pregnancy test kits, daytime gelatin capsules, and uh, nicotine gum. Tablet testing. The tablet group mixes tablets at several manufacturing stages. Uh, there's three stages. You got the mix, which is the granulation of the powder that contains all ingredients off, uh, of the final tablet. Uh, compressed tablet, tablets that lack the glossy outer coating of the finished tablet. And then the coated compressed tablet, which is uh, finished tablets that are ready for packaging. And that's our final step for tablets. And this, will, this uh, little diagram here kind of gives you an idea of what we do as far as quality control and our procurement, which is the people that actually contact the raw material manufacturers and uh, get our products or get our uh, materials from them. So what, 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 they, what they'll do is we'll buy the product so it gets shipped to our warehouse, gets pe put up in, the <coughs> in our warehouse, and then <coughs> per our Perigo SOPs, um, they, they sample the products, they send those up to our lab, and that's all just the pure form, so that's directly from the manufacturer, so it's just the raw materials. And then um, once we pass all of our testing from a raw material standpoint, then all of that goes into production, and we start synthesizing some of these products and uh, start the formulation process. And then, uh, so that right there, that's your mix. And then once it's, it's mixed with the excipients, the, the inactives and the active ingredients, then those come back up to the lab in a mixed form, and then we got to retest those products again, 
because we got to make sure now that not only does it meet the specifications for ibuprofen or aspirin or active, but we got to make sure it meets specifications for some of our inactive ingredients too. And um, so then, then after that passes testing, then it goes back down. And this is actually when the actual production of the tablets start. Excuse me. So, um, so those go through. Then we get the, they formulate the tablets. Then it comes back up for the third time. Then we got to do the testing again for different um, different specifications. The tablet testings will do this, and then um, goes through again. Gets the final coat on the tablet. Test it one more time, and then now it's ready for packaging. And then we can start shipping out those products. <coughs> okay, and liquids testing. Uh, liquids testing group, uh, what they do is they test a lot of our creams and ointment products, uh, two different manufacturing stages, which, which we have uh, in process. After the raw material has been mixed together, they are pumped into a whole tank, and uh, that can con contain several thousand liters of product. Um, the next is uh, the package product, which is QA. Um, products that are that have been placed in the bottles or tube, uh, the customers that we'll use, and then the line startup, uh, which is a few tests, the bottles that are filled by the package equipment before the full run begins. And uh, some of these lineups, uh, these line startups, which Andy could probably go way more in detail than I ever could, but um, these are like pretty important testing so it comes up to our lab pretty hot and once that product is into our lab somebody is notified immediately and, and then we have to start testing on that and once that testing is completed then our production crew can start the process of um, batching up uh, some of those liquids. Lab data. Uh, data in this lab is kept in two systems. Um, currently, we use a lab notebook, and then um, all the so bas so when you're doing all your testing, you have to record your instruments, your reagents, how you prep some of those reagents, um, any useful information that um, that w that needs to be noted, and then from there you would take that data and then transfer it into our, s our computer software, which is called LIMS. And LIMS is just, it, I mean, it's just a software. That's all it is. We just plug all of our numbers in there, make sure everything passes. And then after that, um, we submit all that stuff in for review by a paper checker, and they make sure we did everything correctly. Um, and one of our newer things that we're going to start is our electronic notebooks. So all the stuff you guys are learning about notebooks now, you might no longer need. <laughs> so, but it, it is very important to keep good documentation skills um, because it is still a, a big part of our company right now. And it might not be for our quality control department, but um, definitely a lot of our other departments still use raw data as their primary source of recording everything. And this is just an example here of what your notebook page would look like. Um, so up here on the top, you had the analyst, is the analyst name is what you would write your name down, your product code. If you're doing raw material testing, you would put RM, or um, if you're doing a liquids, you would do QA, or tablets would be, what is it for tablets, CT. So. And then now you have your, your test method name or number. So you have a test method name plus the number. And then uh, you list all of your equipment with its identification number, which is the EIN number, and then your calibration dates. And that's very critical that you make sure that everything is calibrated before use. If, you, if it's not calibrated, well, then pretty much everything you did on that test is invalid, and you have to restart over, and that uh, can cost quite a bit of money redoing tests. So, um, yeah, I don't know, is there anything else you want to add on the, the notebook pages? Sure. Uh, from, from a trainer standpoint, uh, this is something that new people benefit from. Uh, if you apply a lot of these skills, you know, in school, uh, when you come into the lab setting, it's a lot easier. This looks simple, uh, but some people really struggle with this. Uh, 
you don't have to have grade A handwriting, but it has to be legible, and you have to be able to keep it in a nice, easy manner because people do review this stuff. Uh, things like footnoting at the bottom of the page. Uh, so your lab data you take now, you know, they, they probably stress don't scribble it out. Uh, this is where it comes from. Because from a, a company standpoint, th that's how you document things. So it doesn't look like you're hiding data. Uh, it, it would look like from the FDA standpoint that what happened here if you just black this out or just crumbled this piece of paper up and threw it in the trash can. Uh, so that's why your teachers kind of push that on you guys when you're in lab. Yeah, and that's why, too, that it's, it's very important to be uh, very detailed when you're filling out your notebook pages, too, because um, what this is, is this is going to be a permanent record attached to every product that's associated with whatever you're testing at that day. So if the FDA does come up and they want to review some of the documentation history on some of these batches that you were testing, um, they will look through this with a fine-tooth comb, and they want to make sure that... Um, everything was done correctly and properly. And so making these nice one strike lines through your is it's very easy for everybody to review and make sure everybody understands. So and uh, all right, getting into the fun stuff, the equipment. Uh, how many of you guys uh, enjoy like technology and maybe working with the latest, greatest, you know, gad gadgets and gizmos, that type of stuff? If that's something you're interested in, uh, Perigo is definitely the place for you because we're always not only working with, you know, the, the newest stuff that you're already used to in a uh, school setting, but, you know, a few years down the road, we're always getting something new, something better. Uh, so that's what the purpose of the next slides are going to be. So we're going to go into some of the equipment we use. We've got pictures of it. Andy's going to uh, discuss in detail uh, kind of briefly on how we use it and how it functions. Uh, so most of our testing is done by either UV vis, uh, atomic absorption, gas chromatography, FTIR, NIR, and then the basic pH meters, that type of stuff. Uh, so some of those things you may not be familiar with yet, but most of these we did get trained on here before we went to uh, work. Uh, basic wet chemistry techniques such as titrations, separations, uh, and extractions, that type of stuff is available as well uh, at Perigo. Uh, and then it depends on what, what you're really testing and what you're going to be trained on once you do start at the company. Uh, so that's what that last statement is. There are uh, laboratory teams expose technicians to various testing types. So someone that works in the tablet group might be trained on different things than someone's testing primarily just, you know, liquids. So uh, the next couple slides are just kind of give you a feel for what, you know, a, a lab setting's like in uh, a big corporation compared to, you know, a, a lab setting. So this is what the entrance to our lab looks like. We actually have to go through a manufacturing facility to get there. Uh, and then that's just one quick shot of, you know, kind of the what's going on in the lab. So you look in there, there's a lot of instruments uh, out in the benches there. Pretty much every square inch of the counter space is designated real estate for some type of piece of equipment that is in use. Uh, and then you do see some technicians, you know, using like a balance in the background there. Uh, another example of that, you don't see much counter space there. You see equipment everywhere. That, that's how every inch of that lab looks just about. And glassware, you guys uh, are probably familiar with using some glassware in the lab setting at this point. Uh, you know, a couple beakers or some volumetric flasks. This is an example of how much glassware we go through. And our dishwashers, we got two dishwashers that run around the clock. They're validated for cleaning this glassware. I was told they're about $80,000 a piece. Uh, so that kind of goes into de detail, too, how much glassware we're going through. We're constantly turning this around. And reagents, you guys may not see all the reagents that uh, you guys house here in the back, but there's quite a few. This is a s just a small example, a quick shot of, you know, some of the dry reagents that we have for a lot of our testing. Just about anything you could imagine we've got available for our lab testing needs. And now Andy is going to go over the rest of the equipment. Thank you. All right. This starting out here is our basic balance. Um, and it just take is what we use to s start every test. Um, we have to take the mass of our product to get an accurate weight so we know where we're starting from. And we have four different types of balances. We have a uh, semi-micro, analytical, top loader, and micro balances. And the difference in those mainly is just uh, 
the amount of accuracy you need. Uh, micro balance is more accurate than the semi micro and on up. So depending on how many decimal places of accuracy you need uh, dictates which balance you use. Um, a UV vis. Um, we use these mostly in ID tests and in assay tests of our dissolution. Um, we use the uh, the UV vis uh, to we use the uh, a normal or a, a singular wavelength of light that we shoot through the uh, a cuvette of the product, and it we measure the uh, absorbance of that wavelength of light by our product to determine how much uh, of the active ingredient is in that product. Um, and Nick is going to talk about the GC. Yes, thank you, Andy. Um, okay, the GC. Now, this is something that I have put a lot of work into since I started at Perigo. Um, GC, I don't know if you guys are familiar yet with gas chromatography. Um, but it is definitely, this is what we use on a raw material standpoint. We do a lot of HPLC testing too, but GC is pretty much what we use for a lot of our purity analysis. And we also use this a lot for our identification. You know, like if, if we have ibuprofen or if we're doing um, one of our active ingredients, we'll just sh shoot our sample in through there along with some standards. And just to make sure that our peaks are coming off at the same time as our retention time. And the way how this guy kind of works here is uh, uh, right here in the injection port, which is probably something very new to you guys because you guys don't have this right now. You guys are still manually feeding everything through your uh, into your GC. And what this does is just it just you have your needle here, and um, once you trigger on your software program uh, that you you're ready to make an injection, it'll just rapidly shoot uh, your aliquot of your sample right into the GC and right inside of this guy right here is your um, injection port and once that um, that liquid is injected into there it immediately volatilizes so it's extremely important that you are very quick and very precise and accurate with your injections that's why this guy is definitely useful for our from our standpoint, you know, from what you guys are doing here is going to be perfectly fine doing mainly injections, but um, the slower you take to inject it, the faster it's going to volatilize and um, the less accurate and precise you're going to be if, if you're doing it on a routine, routine basis. Okay, and then so um, once it's in here, we have uh, inert gases, which is our mobile phases, inert gases that we use right now are hydrogen, um, nitrogen and helium. We primarily use hydrogen and helium. Uh, we just don't use nitrogen that much. But um, f so from there, the inert gases pushes it in through our column, and the inside of here is um, it's an oven basically. So it heats up your column, shoots it through this uh, your column here that's uh, has a stationary phase on it, and from that stationary phase is uh, where you're. At aliquot of your uh, sample is separated out and then it gets pushed up through the detector and this is the last step right here and the detector kind of just sees all the components that were that are coming out from that column so um, yeah and right now we have four GC's on hand um, we use it all the time and it could be very painful sometimes to get that thing to work properly but uh, we we have a metrology group that works really hard at for our needs. So, and then uh, here we have our, our headspace, which is connected to a, a, a GC. So we ha we actually have two headspace units in the lab right now, and headspace really is uh, it's a it's a newer type of um, analysis that it's kind of it's it's not that new right now it's I think it came out maybe like four or five years ago but it's definitely um, been gaining a lot of recognition in the pharmaceutical industry and um, they also use it for blood analysis maybe for like forensics or uh, things of that nature but um, what this is really is just a big incubator if you will it just it's a catalyst it helps speeds up reactions you have um, 
20 to 10 mil vials that you use and what this does here is you have your vial you can't really see it right here but there's a little crimp cap right here with a glass um, vial right there it gets dropped into the headspace and once it's in that headspace it uh, goes through a series of um, temperature changes and it shakes continuously so what you're trying to do is speed up that reaction and then this right here is your transfer line your transfer line basically is what is taking the injection and then shooting it into your GC and then through the column and what this does here is, in, uh, is compared to using this is you're injecting liquid right here in headspace chromatography you are injecting the gas so when it shakes that vial rapidly it draws the the volatiles off the headspace of that cap so you're injecting so you're just drawing out the gases from those volatiles and then um, injecting it into your GC so it's kind of just like the nuts and bolts of that but it's it's definitely something that we have been using a lot for our residual solvents testing and those are just really impure or there's a lot of impurities in some of our products from the synthesis of our products so uh, we just got to go through and make sure that everything meets FDA requirements before we can start shipping those products out Okay, next we have our HPLCs, and uh, when you work in the liquid and the tablet groups, this is the, uh, the main equipment we use for all of our assay testing, uh, strength, and also impurity testing. Um, and how an HPLC works is, you can see up here we have these, the bottles of liquids. These hold our mobile phases, and these are usually organic and polar, and they will, uh, be pumped through the system and we w uh, have a column which is called our inactive and we will inject our sample into the system and it gets held up in the immobile phase and the stationary phase excuse me and as that mobile phase pumps through that stationary phase it draws out all the separate parts of the product that we've injected it will uh, separate the excipients, like all the waxes and sugars, from the actual uh, pharmaceutical ingredient. And that way we get, when it comes through the detector, it, it will get a, a peak like this here. And then there we have a mathematical uh, computer program that actually measures the heights of those peaks. And we can we'll pre prep a standard from our pharmaceutical ingredient and we prep a sample of our product and we can compare from that standard where we know exactly the amount we can compare to what's in our sample so we can find out if we have the right amount of our product in our in each product code and like I say we use this on every product up here this is what we do the most of in the uh, in the pro or in the tablet and liquid groups, and we also have the ultra performance liquid chromatography. This is a relatively new instrument, and uh, this works the exact same way as the HPLC that I showed you before. But this we use a lot smaller columns, so it really drives the pressure up. Like our HPLCs run about 2,000 psi where these run about 7,000 PSI. And the benefit of that is it allows us to separate out a lot more excipients and peaks because it's so, it's a lot more uh, selective. And it also speeds up run times. Like uh, we've had runs on HPLC that we would take 20 hours to run. We've redone those methods to run on a UPLC and we've cut that down to an hour, hour and 15. You can really cut down the amount of time and mobile phase that it takes to uh, complete a run with a UPLC. Um, we also use uh, Carl Fisher titrations. We use these mostly for our tablet products um, where we need to know the amount of water that is stuck in our tablets so we will grind them up and put them in a Carl Fisher and it is, has a computer potenti uh, potentially or metrically uh, analyzes the amount of water 
in the product and it prints out uh, a sheet that gives the percent of water in the products. Um, we also have the manual dissolution baths. Um, these are more s mostly for tablets. So we have these tablets that are compressed together very tightly. So we need to make sure that when you take them that they are able to break apart so you can absorb the ingredients into your body. So in each one of these vessels, we have an exact amount of liquid that we know, so we know what it is, and we usually pH that to match whatever uh, part of the body the tablet's supposed to absorb into. So when we drop the pills into each of those baths for a set amount of time to make sure that they disperse so that they uh, can be absorbed into your body, and then we will draw samples of this after the set time, and we'll either run that through an HPLC or a UV Viz to test their assay strength. And then we also have uh, automated dissolution baths, and these are like the manual except super fancy, to where it has the same baths that you drop the tablets in, but it has automatic uh, needles that will actually pull the sample at set times and run it through a UV vis all on its own. So we don't, once we have it set up, it runs the whole test without us. Um, we usually do this test for ones that need to be pulled at multiple times. Like we have products that need to be pulled, have samples drawn after two hours, six hours, and eight hours. So this we'll use so we don't have to be by the machine every time we need to pull a sample. And uh, we also still do the handy dandy old fashioned titrations with a, a beerette and a stir plate. Um, we don't do these as much anymore, but it's one of the basic things you learn first chem class and we still use them today because they're very important and they're very accurate. And then Eric will take it from there. All right, mo most of the instruments you guys have seen so far were actually used for uh, quantitative purposes. So we're looking at how much is in there. So we want to make sure there's actually 200 milligrams of ibuprofen in you know, our finished tablet. Uh, but a role that Nick kind of went over at the beginning of the presentation was qualitative testing, making sure it's what it's supposed to be. That's important for at the end of the day when we make our product, but it's also important for our raw materials when we purchase something. Uh, again, we purchase thousands of raw materials from companies all over the world, and it doesn't matter what it is, uh, but if it's a filler, a binder material, some kind of uh, coating, uh, anything in those natures, they just so happen to be a fine white powder. So it's like looking at flour and powdered sugar. It's hard to tell what it is. That's how our raw materials look. This instrument is going to ID that for us so we can confirm that yeah, Shipper A sent us acetaminophen and not aspirin. Uh, what it does is it, uh, or excuse me, it's an NIR, which stands for Near Infrared Spectroscopy. So what it's going to do is it's going to project a beam of near infrared radiation through the sample. Uh, the sample gets placed right on the top here. Uh, every sample that we have, it's got its own unique spectra associated with it. We call that, uh, it's almost like your fingerprint. So every single product we scan has its own unique spectra associated to that. Uh, we're just going to place the sample on the top, you know, push a couple buttons on the computer, and it's going to tell us if it matches up to what it's supposed to be. Uh, this is really important to, uh, for us because this saved us a lot of time. Uh, that takes about 10 seconds to do, and we got thousands of raw materials coming in every day. Uh, traditional identification tests can take anywhere from, you know, one hour to four hours. That's a lot of time if you got to do that for everything that comes in the door. So this is fast, real easy. Uh, and another benefit with this too, I forgot to mention, is it will scan directly through a sampling bag. So the powders come in a bag almost like this, it'll scan right through the bag. It can also scan through the outer coating of a tablet. So you've all seen tablets, you know, they're orange, they're blue. The inside is actually where the uh, API is held. It can scan directly into that tablet and confirm that the finished product has all the correct materials in it as well. So that's fast, it's easy. Now, this is what most people get trained on traditionally. Uh, this is called the FTIR. Uh, this instrument works in the same manner, but it, it's not looking at the near infrared region as much. It's actually looking at the mid infrared uh, wavelengths. This, this is kind of fun because you actually get to see the spectra. So over at the far right, or yeah, your far right, you will see the spectra there. What we're looking at, again, is what we call the fingerprint. We're making sure that those peaks there 
are matching up. So we scanned a sample, we're comparing it to a standard that was already scanned into this instrument, making sure all of those peaks there, those little dips, those are matching up. That's how we make sure they're the exact same uh, components. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but in this situation it's good because they're pretty much the same material there. You'll see all those peaks overlaying on the top and on the bottom. Uh, this one here, uh, you're talking about usually two or three hours worth of sample prep. Uh, you're working with harmful solvents sometimes, uh, just not as fast a turnaround time. So most of the methods that were on this instrument have been converted to that NIR instrument, which I talked about. Uh, so if you do prefer to see, you know, the end result, sometimes this is kind of cool to set up at the end of the day. You actually get to see your work compared to, I got a green screen, my, my product matched the other product, I'm good to go. So, is it still me? Yep. Uh, laboratory environment, pretty professional environment. Uh, we are CGMP uh, environment, which is FDA required or regulated. Uh, CGMP stands for Current Good Manufacturing Practices. So basically, they're going to set the bar. They tell us how ha things have to be run. We get a little pamphlet. And then all of our standard operating procedures are going to be based directly off of what the FDA tells us to do. Uh, strict laboratory documentation guidelines. So you saw an example of that. Uh, you know, footnoting stuff using a blue or black pen. So no glitter pens, no red pens, uh, and no scribbles. Starting at Perigo, uh, a lot of people like at the hours that we offer in the lab environment. Uh, there's two, four hour, or two to four weeks worth of initial training. Uh, right off the bat, people typically will get trained in dissolution testing, uh, and then they move on through all the other groups after that point in time. So that takes two to four weeks. One week is orientation. Uh, basically, what you're going to be doing is going over how to document stuff, how to do a basic description test. Uh, and then you're going to be reading one of the, about the 250 SOPs, standard operating procedures that you're entitled to read during that training period. Uh, on the plus side, you get paid to read them. So uh, it's not too often you get paid to read documents. Uh, and then you have ongoing training throughout the careers needed to support your job function. So all of those instruments, we have to actually train you on those. You can't just go up to them and kind of guess how to push buttons. Uh, most of those things might take a few hours. Whereas the HPLC, that will take you four to five days to get trained on. And then there's further training based off the HPLC. So if you get trained on impurity testing, uh, things of that, that nature, that could be additional days because they're more involved. Uh, what we find with uh, HPLC and GC and the UPLC instruments, which we talked about, the most difficult portion of that is learning the software. Once you got the software down, Moving on to the next instrument, it's really easy because they apply the same basic software that you guys actually will use here in this facility. So here's the hours. Uh, we have a four tens, so you can work Monday through Thursday, and those are the hours available if that's the route uh, that's offered to you if you ever apply at Perigo. Uh, so they have a first shift, a second shift, and a third shift. Uh, but they also have a weekend shift, which a lot of people go into school. They really like this one. Three 12 hour shifts, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You don't get your weekends anymore. But they're going to uh, make up for that by giving you the four hours that you don't work. So you're actually going to get paid for 40 hours, even though you only work 36 hours. So that's a benefit. A lot of people like the, the weekend shift because of that. Uh, some benefits we have entry level technicians will start out at about $14.50 an hour through manpower. Uh, plus 60 cents per hour for night shift. So second shift, I believe weekends might get that too. Um, once hired in, you get excellent health insurance, 401k with company matching, profit sharing, tuition reimbursement, I believe it's a little over five grand per year, annual bonuses, and from, past, uh, from the past, it's been anywhere from six to 10% of your pay. That's what your bonus has been at the end of the year. Uh, that does vary, we target for 5%. Uh, but depending on how well we meet our metrics as a company, you might get a little bit bigger of a bonus than that. Uh, we have Fit for Life, which is, you know, they just, you know, try to get you to go out there and be active, you know, run a 5K, that type of stuff. They give you points and awards, encourage you to do that. Company Picnic, uh, I heard they had an elephant there last year, so people like to bring their kids there. And you also get a holiday turkey come, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas time. I still have mine in my freezer. Uh, 
Annual review with uh, merit-based pay increases. I think this is a big one because I, I worked at grocery stores before, and basically, you know, it's just do your job, and they don't tell you if you're doing well or not. Uh, they actually review each month how you're doing. You know, they give you goals. Uh, they encourage you to kind of go above and beyond. Uh, and then at the end of the year, you can get that merit-based, you know, pay raise. Uh, and I've been pretty happy with them. They do, uh, they do want to keep you around. So, uh, and then you get prom promotions. Uh, we call them grade level promo promotions. They recently changed the numbers, uh, but basically you're just going to start out entry level and then you can move up. They got different requirements for that. Uh, it, previously, you would start out as at a grade six, and then after about four years, you would be a grade nine. Uh, it takes a few years to get to that point. And they have different requirements for that, uh, depending on what group you're working for. Uh, supervisors will set, you know, a bar for you. You know, work on your leadership, uh, that type of stuff. Uh, you know, maybe you're going to be mentoring new coming employees uh, to help them get to that next. It's going to help you get to that next grade level. And this is pretty much going to be the end of the uh, presentation. We're going to open it up to questions. Uh, if you, you know, in your spare time, if you're curious how Perigo is as a company, you can take a look. We're available on the internet there on LinkedIn, Facebook, everything that everyone uh, is used to in this day and age. Uh, we have YouTube videos too, believe it or not. And if we have time, we might, we might play one or two of those. Otherwise, you can watch them on your own. So any questions that you guys have? Yes. No, we, we, we have, you know, upwards of 30 instruments, but that's more of, that's their instrument to clean on a regular basis. So they're very, you know, sensitive pieces of equipment. And what we found in the past is uh, they weren't getting flushed out enough. So now we assign a, an in individual to an instrument. They have to clean it during that time frame. Uh, that's why we label that. Uh, the way they're divided now is they're actually broke up into different sections depending on what you're testing in the lab. So someone testing ibuprofen, they might have two or three HPLCs compared to someone testing, you know, aspirin. They might have two, two HPLCs that they use. Uh, those are actually, you know, within walking distance from where they're sitting, uh, those are the instruments they use probably on a daily basis. So. Uh, that's a good question. We're, we do have a research lab. We have a lot of labs, actually. This environment we just went over here, this is more of the quality control. So ensuring our products before they go out the door, you know, are good to go. But the research portion of it, we do have a research lab, an analytical research and development lab. What they're doing is they're kind of working with marketing and stuff, figuring out what products are going to come off their patent in the next five years. We're going to figure out how to make this. So from a lab standpoint, we do have, you know, the research scientists that are going to figure out what's inside this product, you know, and then they're going to figure out how to make that, what lab, they're going to make all of the test methods that we're going to use uh, testing-wise. So there, there's a lot of uh, production. Uh, actually, that, that first picture I showed you when you're walking into the plant, uh, it's basically manufacturing. Um, it's, that's the largest portion of that facility in Allegan there is manufacturing. And then the small portion of us, the quality control lab, uh, we're probably about the size of this top floor here, the whole lab, I would say. So. Yep. Uh, kind of both, because like when you when you first start, they pretty much think you know nothing, and you really don't. So as you but they're very good about training you. It, and as you get more education, you move up the the rank. And once you get to know more, like, you, when you first start, you're given a mentor. And that person is someone who's been with the company a few years, knows all the testing that's required of you, and helps you along to do that. And then once you get up there, like, I just got trained through the mentor program, and now I'm mentoring new employees that just come in. So that's how you, uh, you go up through the ranks.
That's correct. Uh, as far as I can, can see, is your game mostly composed of like working in a team-based setting, or is it most is it like non-supervised, independent work? You probably do both, but I mean, which yeah. Is um, once once you get trained, I would say it's more of an independent. Like you talk to your boss right when you get there and say, and sh they'll tell you, I need these products tested today, and then they'll just let you to do it, and then you go and do it. So it's, but, and then there's a lot of things that are very, you know, large in scope to where you'll work in teams to do it. So it's, it's I'd say it's about 50-50. I mean, you do a lot of work on your own but there's always people there to help you out if you get into trouble, and there's a lot of group projects that are available to do also. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> yeah. Um, kind of like on, on his point, um, like when we get products into our lab, um, we have, like, so let's say the raw material standpoint, we'll have products that come in We'll have, you know, 20, as little as 20 new products coming in, or we'll have as m many as 80 products coming in in one day. So depending on whatever our workload is, our WIP, our work in progress is, those all get categorized based off of priority. So if we're all of a sudden really low on ibuprofen and a batch of ibuprofen comes into our lab, we need to get those out as soon as possible. And kind of on to what your question was, about group settings or individual work. Um, for raw materials, it's a lot of individual type work. You, you start out new and you get the mentor and they kind of just, they, they, they aid you along, just make sure everything is going well. Any questions you have, you directly talk to them. And, and if it's something that the mentor won't know, then you go to your supervisor. Whereas uh, tablets is a lot of group um, action going on because they, they their supervisor actually delegates the work, says that this is what you need to do, this is what you need to focus on. But um, but as far as priority goes, we have a lot of priority products that come in and we have to get those in and out because we're, we're a quality lab, but we're also a release lab. So we need to get it in and get it out. We, we supposedly had the fastest turnaround time uh, for any you know quality control lab uh, in the United States or in the world for what I was told. Uh, a lot of our products might be, you know, two or three days turnaround time where some companies it takes them um, closer to a month. So we get them out pretty quickly. What, what do we do with what? The chemical waste, we, we actually, we have a, a safety program. So that's part of orientation training. Uh, so we'll go over, you know, how to work with chemical waste and then how it gets stored. W on a monthly basis, we have a, a company that comes and picks up. We got a big barrel of it, and they pick that up for us. Uh, as far as, like, hazardous waste that we work with, we, we generate quite a bit, but a lot of our newer technology that we get, it actually uh, decreases the amount of that hazardous waste that is generated. So HPLCs, for example, they, they'll run, like, acetyl nitrile, which is very bad for your health as one of the components in your mobile phase, that does get stored until that company comes and picks it up. Uh, so we, we do have a, you know, a large drum and it gets stored in there. So, but we go over all the training for that type of stuff, so. So you were, you were asking about, you, you log it into your notebook and then SharePoint? Yeah, oh. oh, you are? Gotcha. Uh, w our electronic notebook, I'm not exactly sure how that's all tied in with everything. It's, I haven't been trained on it yet. Uh, but that is going to be more of, once it's logged into our LIMS operating system, uh, then it gets kicked into the technician that, yeah, I have to test this. They got that electronic notebook. So they just walk through, do all their testing. Then the electronic notebook pushes it back into limbs. F from where it goes from there. Okay. Gotcha. If you can. What, what's that? 
I, I'm sorry, I still didn't hear you. Well, why I work at Perigo? Uh, Honestly, when I when I was in the program here, it was you know that was one of the topics of you know possible opportunities. You can go to Perigo. So um, I remember Perigo coming in here because I was sitting probably in that seat right there when Perigo first came here about six years ago. That's where I was sitting. So I remember the presentation, uh, uh, and it was just something I happened to apply for, uh, and I worked with Dr. Niles on that, and he got me the contacts. So uh, it's it's a pretty pretty good place to work for and. Uh, that's that's how I became aware of it. I probably would have never known what Perigo was if it wasn't sitting right there. So, I just want to add on that. Um, I like the same thing. I was sitting right where you are in the hat when I had the Perigo come in, and uh, what really uh, got me thinking about working there was our our shifts. Like I worked the weekend shift. I worked Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I go to school at Grand Valley during the week, Monday through Thursday. And that it's really helping me get through to get my bachelor's degree. And plus, I get $5,280 a year for school from Perigo, providing I get a C plus or better in every class I'm in. So it's, it's awesome, and it, it really helps me get through school. And it takes a big chunk out of what would have had to come out of my pocket. Perigo pays for Yep, that's the minimum, and we're always busy, so you can always work any amount of overtime that you want most of the time. I don't take full time. I'm taking eight credits this semester, or nine credits, I'm sorry. So it it's going to take me longer, but I'll be debt-free when I get out, so I think it's worth it. And working the weekends, it really cuts into your social life, but I think it's worth it to get through it for a couple years, and then you'll you'll be set up a lot better to have a little bit more fun when you're done. Uh, yep. Yep, that's correct. Um, I took, I graduated with an associates in the chem tech and that was all I needed to get into the program and, and then working up from there. Uh, mine is uh, biochemical and or just biochemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for just a general business degree, so at Davenport. So again, just like Andy, uh, I'm just taking two or three classes at a time, and it, it is it's a lot of work. But he works weekends. Uh, I, I work during the week, and I'll take night classes. Uh, uh, so yeah, it's a, it's quite a bit of workload, but. You know, getting in the door at a great company, and if you only have a two-year degree, uh, like, it's a really good company to start off at with a two-year degree and be able to move up forward. You know, you don't need that four-year degree to get in through the door. So, uh, really, like, at that point, you got a bachelor's degree and you go, you know, work for a research lab. I mean, maybe you're better off, you know, trying to apply, you know, a smaller lab first to get used to the lab environment and then working your way towards that research lab and your education at the same time, so... Just to kind of just add on to it, um, like everybody pretty much knows around here that Spectrum is a great company to work for, but everybody also knows that Spectrum is a terror. Like it's just really hard to get in unless you know somebody. So, and I kind of feel the same. The same rules apply for Perigo, and then I was in this same class too when uh, one of our supervisors came and gave our presentation, and I was hooked just like Andy once I saw those hours because. It just worked like uh, four days a week, ten hours. Are you kidding me? It's like I'll do that, but I never wanted to do the weekend shift. I loved my weekend and my social life way too much for that. So, but um, I I too am just gonna start going back to school myself because I have a two-year degree from here, and that's it. But as far as um, four-year degrees go, I mean we have a wide range of people in the lab with all kinds of different degrees. I mean we have philosophy majors, we have people that are have master's degrees too so Physics, I mean biology. if you can get in with a two-year degree but also work next to somebody that has a master's degree and something else I mean the opportunities are great at Perigo because um, for me I started out with my two-year degree here went there got my job uh, worked my up through the ranks and the, the quality control for the raw materials and now I am an auditor so I get to go out 
travel around the country and audit different contract labs that because sometimes our workload is just it's too much like we just cannot keep afloat so we have to send some of our testing out to different facilities and in order to do so we have to approve those facilities and that's what they send me out to go do is just to prove them but there's definitely a lot of opportunities you don't have to be thinking that you, you come in and you're only going to be a lab technician and that's it once you're in the door the the opportunities are great yeah, because we also, we have accountants, we have human resources people, we have lawyers, we have, you know, we're not just chemists. And, I mean, we have a wide spectrum of employment opportunities in the company alone, you know. So it's, there's very vast opportunity. Um, well, I found it works out a lot better because with already having the background at, from this school and working with a lot of the different chemicals that I'm learning about in my, my biochem classes, it's, I find I have a leg up over most of the students there because I already, I'm not going into it cold. I know, I'm, I'm not know exactly what I'm talking about, but I know, you know, the basis of what it, of what they're trying to get across. So I find that I pick up on things a lot easier because of the work I do at Perigo and the background I've, I had from Dr. Niles' classes here. Hold your hand up. Um, so you said that a lot of your skills have been created through the contract field. Is there a certain type of abuse you're aware of, or is it just you kind of just get rid of it once you have an employee? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Typically, it's impurity stuff. Uh, mostly, we're just confirming that it's not there. Okay. So that's what we're doing. We're just proving to them. We have limits on those, and those uh, we have a maximum limit for how much is allowed to be in that product. But uh, like I was talking to Nick the other day, like organic wasn't my theme, but I remember uh, I remember making aspirin in an organic lab. Uh, one of our uh, problems we have with aspirin is, have you ever opened up the bottle bottle of aspirin and you found that it's got the absorbent material in it? It's removing water. So when aspirin's in the presence of water, it's going to convert back into salicylic acid. So we're going to confirm that there's not salicylic acid in that product before we ship it, and then we do stability testing on it over its lifetime to make sure it's not converting back into that product too. Uh, but yeah, mostly it's confirming it's not there before we ship it out. So, but if those if those impurities do exceed those limits, then we just flat out reject that batch, and we can no longer use it for anything. So we just pretty much ate the cost of that material. As for me right now, I have no plans to branch out. Um, I, I'm not quite going to say I'm a lifer there yet, but I definitely do um, like that job a lot. It's really great. They give me a lot of opportunities right, right away. Like I said, um, you know, starting out with a two-year degree, working myself up to the ranks, they give you a lot of opportunities to grow, too. So if you show good leadership and show good technical skills and analytical skills, they'll notice that, and believe me, they do, and they will give you a lot more opportunities where, um, since I work in the raw materials department, we work very closely with our analytical and research and development. Um, so I was able to uh, connect with them and start doing actually test method validations where I was helping create methods, uh, all that kind of stuff. So the, I definitely probably will stay there for a while. I do things on the side. I also am a property owner, <laughs> but um, I definitely do like working at Perigo a lot. Yeah, I'm 12 miles from there, so I'm not going anywhere. I don't like commuting, but it is... It's a great place. It's it's the best job I've ever had, and I'm planning on staying there as long as they'll have me. <laughs> uh, another example to go with that is um, how many times have you worked at a job and you're like, I, I hate this process. Why can't we change it? And your boss is like, just do it. Have you, have you guys ever seen that? Uh, Perigo, they, re they really push Lean Sigma principles, uh, which is basically uh, – what Toyota did, you know, with their assembly lines. How can we perfect this to make it as efficient as possible? So if there's a process in the facility where you're like, you know, this isn't as efficient as we can make it, they train you, you know, to go to Lean Sigma training classes 
Uh, so you can apply all of those concepts and then you can show this is how it was before. I changed it, this is how it is now. And then you can even put a dollar value or a time saving to that sometimes. So, so that's pretty cool and that's something I enjoy, so. I was uh, putting groceries in the back of Dr. Nile's car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for me, I, I just worked a lot of summer jobs. So I, I did a lot of um, production line type stuff when I wasn't in school. And um, yeah, that's pretty much all I did. Uh, I, was, I actually went to college late. I didn't start college till I was 26. I worked as a uh, tool and die worker for the first eight years of my life after I got out of high school. No, it, it's a publicly traded company. So, I mean, we have, we have a CEO and stockholders. Um, I'm not sure who the majority stockholder is, but so it's a publicly owned company, so you could you could own part of it too if you wanted. Hmm. Uh, a, a lot of the times, I think we try to match what is you know, the name brand looks like. So they'll, they'll match that coating, but it does affect its dissolution rate as well. You don't want it to dissolve, you know, immediately in your mouth. You want it to dissolve, you know, inside of your stomach. Uh, but we also have products sometimes that dissolve like further uh, into your system. So like your intestine, uh, there's different coatings that they'll use for that. So a lot of the time that's what I think it's for. And it's also for taste. If you've, you can buy uncoated tablets and they, they taste terrible. Uh, th these are a lot easier to, you know, to, di to digest, so. It used to, used to be that way, but going back to the Lean Sigma stuff, what they did was they figured out we were more efficient when we had, you know, turnaround time. So we got turnaround times for all of our products, and then it's first in, first out. Uh, so at that point, we, if something's hot, they need ibuprofen out the door, we're going to work on, you know, our scheduled system because you're actually more efficient at the end of the week uh, if you just stick to a one system compared to going back and forth on... No, no, we all work together. All for one, one for all. Even, even between the group, but using raw materials, I'm in liquids, and before he became a trainer, he was in tablets. We're all on the same team, and so it's not like we were elbowing each other out of the way to get to a system so we could get our stuff tested before them. Although that does happen. <laughs> elbowing for a system. <laughs> yeah. Do you know that number? I, I know li from like the financial statements, like the inventory turnover time, which is like average for like all of the products we make. It's uh, for a pharmaceutical industry, you don't turn over products like you do cars, so it's a little bit slower. Uh, I don't have an exact figure on that, uh, but it, it's for a pharmaceutical or a pharmaceutical standpoint, I think it's pretty quick, about as quick as you can to ensure quality. Uh, but you have so many things at different stages. It's not like you got a raw material that comes in. And then six months later, you have a finished product. It's happening at different stages at different points of time. So you always have a constant flow of a product coming into the lab and then going off the assembly line. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we actually, we get the API itself, so the aspirin that's made by another company, 
Um, so we, we get it in its raw form at that point. They're, they're going to be the ones that's going to synthesize that and produce it. Uh, we, we don't go through any of that at this point. Yep. Um, HPLCs, um, you make a computer model of all the injections that you need it to sample, and once you hit the big green button on top, you know, I always walk away and start doing something else and then come back later to analyze the results after it's done, and I'd say, I'm trying to think, I think UV Vis and the DISO baths are about the only things you really need to babysit. Everything else you can usually get your run going and then go do something else until it's done and come back to it later. Yeah, yeah it, it kind of just depends on the situation really. Um, there, I mean, recalls can come from anything as little as um, a label. Yeah, the incorrect label went on the product. Um, something, somebody f made a, used the wrong reagent on a product that was used to, for that manufacturing batch. It could get recalled from that. Um, geez, I don't, I'm not sure what else. I, th I think he labeled pretty much the obvious ones, like the labels, like little things like that, f you know, if they put like the wrong units on it or, uh, you know, is it sugar free, uh, but there's actually a sugar in there and they forgot to put that on the label, something like that. Uh, we do stability testing too. So all of the testing we do in the quality control lab, we have a separate lab uh, called the stability lab. They're going to do the same test during the whole life expectancy of that product. So if it's good for two years, but they test it after a year, now now it's not meeting that requirement, we might have to have a recall for something like that, too. Uh, but you, you can have all, all sorts of reasons for that type of stuff. So, Any other questions? For the potency of the tablet, is that we talk about? So, but before they, before they make it a tablet, app. Yep. Yeah, it depends on the product, but a lot of them they'll test it as they mix it, and then when they turn it into a tablet, they'll test it. But then when they code it, when they're done coding it, they'll test it again to make sure. Uh, it depends on the product. A lot of the times we can. We could prove to the FDA that we don't have a problem with any of our processes. They're controlled. So they say as long as the end of the day product is set, you can test just that one time. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it could be, it's a little bit of both pretty much. Um, as far as raw materials go, uh, there's GC is a pretty extensive test. So it's one of the testing, it's one of the last things you get trained on in testing for raw materials because it's, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of maintenance, it's a lot of troubleshooting. So you want your experienced technicians to be working on it. So uh, depending on the shift or depending on who is your experienced, te uh, excuse me, experienced technician on that shift will primarily use that instrument um, as far as other uh, groups like liquids uh, tablets I believe they pretty much share everything yeah in the in the liquids group we're we're subdivided into six other groups like I'm in the ibuprofen group so I test all of our liquid ibuprofen then we have a cough and cold group and then we have our apap group so you once you get 
you kind of get assigned a group once you get fully trained and then they train you in every equipment needed to do in your group and then you continue in that group until you get the full mastery of that group then you'll get moved to a group that has different testing so then you'll learn the different pieces of equipment so you eventually learn all the equipment in the lab but it just depends on what groups you get put in and what order of uh, what order you learn all the equipment yeah um we do have uh apprenticeships or not er, internships um but i i've never done one so i don't really know how to go about getting into any of that so sorry i don't have much info on that um i think you can make it both depending on what you want because um it takes you know you can get up to a, a pretty decent wage in just this job that we have without going any higher I mean you make enough money to live on comfortably um, but with all the benefits they give you and incentives to do more a lot of people end up moving on from the lab it's so it's I'd say it's both but well, we're a high turnover rate just because people branch out within the company so we, we have new people coming in all the time because people in the company are going to you know, supervise a role or they're going to go off and maybe they want to do something more on the business side or quality assurance. Uh, so that's why we're constantly training people. It's not usually because people decided to, to leave the company. So what time is it? Uh, honestly, like, I felt like when I was getting trained, like, the trainers at the time knew, like, the technical aspects of it, but they didn't know in full detail. So uh, I felt like when I was training, I knew everything, but at the same time, you have to put that at the back of your mind and, you know, be willing to learn all of the stuff they're teaching you. Uh, a lot of people, from my point of view, they, they come in from all over the place. You might have people who have never seen an HPLC before, so the fact that you have use an HVLC, you don't know it inside or out, but you have a step ahead than the person that's coming from a biology major, uh, geology majors, business degrees that may have taken a couple chemistry courses. Uh, we even have people with physics degrees. Uh, they, they can work in our lab, but they, they get trained on the HVLCs and it makes sense to them. It takes them more time to understand it, so. Anything on that? That's a Dr. Nile question. You have to give him a yeah, good answer. Right. Right. Yeah, no kidding. But, yeah, I definitely felt like I was properly prepared for um, going into Perigo, not only training but for my interview as well. Uh, I remember we did mock interviews here, and they also helped you set up your resumes. So it was – I almost felt like when I was here I was getting trained for Perigo because of when I – when they came in and spoke for us, I remember thinking, like, this is the company I want to work for. It's in the – I've always liked the, the health field in general. I wanted to go out and do – and work out at Spectrum, but once I saw what Perigo was offering, I felt like I could focus my efforts on to, to these types of classes, and Dr. Nile is definitely properly uh, trained us on everything. So it was nice having experience, you know, when you go into an interview and you're able to talk about certain instrumentation um, – you know, methods, things like that. Uh, yeah, it was pretty pretty easy, I guess. Yeah, and I also just would like to say I thought it was, this whole program was very good to get you started at Perigo, and I just want to say you should really stay on Dr. Niles' good side because he knows my supervisor well, and when I was trying to get a job there, they call him and ask for references a lot, so... It pays to work hard in this class and learn as much as you can and, and get a leg up because he can help you get places too. Well, thank you guys too uh, very much. Yeah. Very thorough questions. Check out the YouTube videos when you go home. Yeah. <laughs>